So hi, everybody, and welcome to our 29th webinar for Designers for Learning. Today is Friday, June 5th, 2015. My name is Jennifer Madrill, and I'm sitting here in Chicago, Illinois. And maybe we could just have Wendy and Tracy give a quick introduction of who you are and where you're at. Hi, I'm Wendy Gentry, and I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech, focusing on um, that degree on instructional design in my final year. And that's where I am today. To tell a little about, about my connection to Designers for Learning, perhaps, I volunteered as a facilitator um, for the last um, cohort who did um, some nonprofit development for, um, with Designers for Learning. So that just wrapped up in May. Yeah, she did a great job. Thanks. And I'm Tracy Betting Wolf. And um, gosh, I, uh, it's, it's hard to introduce like, what do you do. Um, <laughs> So I, I have been for most of my career a designer and a lot of that in corporation at IBM and since leaving IBM have launched my own business um, on a number of different grounds. One thread of that has been um, in artistry and helping people practice um, kind of their own everyday artistry as a way for earning um, personal agency and doing online workshops and helping people um, find that mode of themselves. And the other thread uh, having to do with helping teachers become more creative. And I had co-founded with three other women a business that I have now just stepped away with just because there's just so much stuff and they're fantastic women and they also could speak very well on this topic that we have today. Um, but with that thread, uh, very much fascinated and invested in helping teachers to pursue um, creative capability. Um, and again, this theme of self-agency of how do you help yourself to practice qualities that you may not be able to get to in your regular practice of um, either a profession or a um, a career that has a lot to do with your own sense of personal agency and so in part of that effort you know we were we were putting um, online classes online for teachers and one of the um, platforms that we used was canvas.net and we uh, were looking at how to make canvas.net work with the kinds of philosophies and values that we wanted to embed in the uh, participation with the teachers and their overall outlook and the kinds of things that we wanted them to take away from that experience. So. Okay. Okay, and that is exactly why we invited you. Um, and just to give folks a little bit of background on why we, we think we intersect and why we may have uh, an interesting conversation. Um, as Wendy mentioned, we facilitate, uh, we meaning Designers for Learning, facilitates service learning opportunities for instructional design students who want to partner up with a nonprofit and pound away on an instructional design need. And we've been, up to this point, um, purposely making the cohorts relatively small between, let's say, a maximum of a little over a dozen people down to, I think, what did we have, Wendy, this last time, about nine, nine students plus your, your facilitators. And we purposely did that because with the idea we needed to uh, keep a pretty tight handle on the facilitation aspect. These are virtual experiences. We do have a client where we are working toward a deliverable that will, will be usable for them. And so maybe an abundance, <laughs> overabundance of caution, I don't know. We felt we needed to keep the teams relatively small. So Wendy facilitated a team that included three student designers and herself. She also was mentored by a faculty member. I was there as a guide on the side. And so long, long, long story short, that is a very, very difficult way to manage a course <laughs> from a facilitation standpoint. Okay. Um, it, so far we've felt it's probably, um, in some ways helpful for the students to have that degree of um, connection to a, 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 I don't even want to call ourselves experts because we aren't really experts, subject matter experts in the content necessarily we were developing, but expertise in, in terms of the design process. And so in talking, we said, well, what if we kind of flip our, our design approach a little bit, the facilitation of the service learning experience, and we opened it up. And we thought maybe even a ways to chunk things. Maybe we would have a, a short MOOC of like six, because currently our, our projects are about 16 weeks long. What if we try to chunk something that we um, 
tackle in a six week time period. Those that are still interested after that standpoint and want to get into more of like the intensive piece of it where you're really getting into beyond a trip prototyping stage to actually getting into some um, uh, more intense development work, that would be maybe a smaller cohort of people. And so that just gives you a kind of a brief, would you say, Wendy, lay of the land of where we're at right now, kind of looking at where we've come and where we're kind of peeking through the crystal ball saying, would, would this make sense for us to do? And so, um, you know, if you could maybe give us a sense for what your and your colleagues you worked with when you worked on your, um, your MOOC on the Canvas.net um, platform, what were some of the design considerations you had in terms of what were your goals? And how, what, what, who did you think at the time would be your learners? Who turned out to be your learners? So just kind of describe for us a little bit of what that experience was like, setting it up, and then actually as you got into it. Yeah, one of our biggest concerns um, was that it had to not be so technically intensive that we would forget about, the, you know, that we spent so much more time on getting it to logistically work on a screen that we would forget the, um, the, um, the content. Um, one of the values that we had in um, offering an online class was that um, we didn't feel like we wanted to be um, instructional in the way that here's a body of knowledge, know all of this, take a quiz, then move on, know this, take a quiz, you know, here's some instruction, here's what you need to know. We didn't, our, our philosophy wasn't along those lines, and we were a little nervous that the user interface might restrict us toward that kind of a learning. And, um, and it turned out that we were able to do our more project-based um, uh, kinds of interactions, and that um, the Canvas um, interface then helped us to step through it so that people could follow along and pace themselves together. So it was more of a pacing mechanism than a funnel kind of do this very linear kind of concept with very kind of um, intense instruction, memorize or take notes or whatever, because we weren't, we weren't trying to impart um, explicit knowledge. We wanted them to have um, implicit knowledge by doing things that's where their learning would happen. And so we were able to use the interface to have them step through the various projects and experiences that we scaffolded from them. And then um, we had a conversation about how we would treat grading because of that and how we would use the quizzes because we didn't want to use the quizzes to say, do you now know what you're supposed to know? It, re it really wasn't that kind of an evaluation. It was, um, are you internalizing the message that we're trying to um, bring to you? Are you experiencing the kinds of um, uh, it, empowerment, the kinds of practices? Are, are you able to set into motion these kind of characteristics and qualities for yourself that we're trying to bring into your experience? And so we use the quizzes, you know, this very traditional sense of quiz um, and format within that platform to basically survey and get feedback on is is this bringing to you the intended effect and so that's how we looked at it instead of the more traditional you know here's the instruction do you now know what we told you to know kind of a thing can I ask a quick question? Um, very, with something you spoke on, it is very, and I apologize if I'm now <laughs> creating an echo for everybody. Um, but my question is, uh, is along the lines of what you were saying with it being a project-based focus versus, as you're saying, a traditional MOOC that's like, learn this quiz, learn this quiz, learn this quiz. That's what we do. We're, we're very much project-driven, where there's a, compl a completed del deliverable that people are working on. And so can you speak to that a little bit as far as in your, your class with the, the MOOC that you were t teaching and designing? What, what was the nature of the projects that students were working on and how did you facilitate even just the basics of sharing it and giving each other mm. feedback on projects, those types of things? Yes, this is also another interesting dis uh, discussion that we had. We were very much valuing 
that this was going to be a peer learning experience and that they really needed to have a, um, a, a forum of mutual support. And so the social aspect of this MOOC was really, really, really important to us. And we were torn about how to support that forum. So inside Canvas, they have a chat discussion area and um, it can get as simple or complex as you want it to get. So we had, we had separate modules, one module for each of the, it was five weeks, and we were trying to figure out, well, do we want to separate the discussions into five separate discussions then? And what will happen if we separate the discussions um, into just explicit little forums or have everybody talk in one forum? And, you know, there's trade-offs for those things. So it's like really trying to plan the social support into it. So Canvas has that built into it. But we were also... Um, really wanting to experiment with other social media um, and because these were teachers and because Google has made so many resources available to teachers we really felt that Google Plus as a um, social stream might be a good way to facilitate that social interaction because on there you can it's a good UI you know you can share images movies documents just text, it covers everything. You have threading, you, you know, have all of these things. And so we did both. And we were a little bit trepidatious that we were just creating a lot of overwhelming work for us. And to some extent, it was extra work. Yeah, I found it personally really easy to review the content in the Google Plus forums and really laborious and hard to review the the forum in Canvas, but it's a, a personal bias. I, I just consume the Google Plus much better. I find it really easy to um, really to share, sense, respond, do those things in there. And the, the way that the, it's, I guess it's a matter of design because the Canvas uh, forum is so dense with the text. It's not that the conversations necessarily are different. It's just the way that it's presented. It's very dense. And um, and I guess the other thing was that sometimes it was really hard to know where you left off last in the discussion. And so you'd end up rereading the thing to figure out where was the last thing. And that, to me, was like maddening. I was like, oh my god. And because this is one of the big tasks, is to be really heavily uh, engaged, involved, conversational, supportive, give a lot of attention. This was something that we valued really, really, really much, and people got it. They um, noticed that we were all really involved and took the time to interact with pretty much anything anybody would say. Um, and so, you know, we did both. But I have to say that the canvas.net was where more of the conversation happened. People are not so likely to go outside of a platform to have the conversation. And so a lot of the conversation did happen in Canvas. Um, so that to me is, that you know, that, that just makes it harder for me because I, it's not my preference, but that's where the conversation happened. Um, and I'm sorry, I forgot, what was the part two of your question? Yeah, the, the part two was, so once the students started working on things and were creating deliverables that were part of the, their assignments or things that they were working on, how did you facilitate them either po posting it as well as then you or others being able to offer them feedback? Right, and how were the, how were the projects structured? How did that all, yeah. So, so an example module, we would set up and then we kind of made a uh, pattern, like a template of this, that we repeated each module so people knew what was coming up and how to framework their learning around this. Um, we would introduce each topic with a video, so it's very easy to put videos in Canvas. Um, we would follow a um, kind of a template where the first day was about defining for yourself what something meant. So if, if the topic is curiosity, 
we're not here to tell you what curiosity is. There is no universal, this is curiosity, okay, you got it, go do it kind of a thing. It's like, well, what does it mean to you? And how do you embody it? How do you explore this? How do you understand this? Say what this means to you, and then we would find kind of, that was kind of day one project. And we usually offered some framework for them to fill in that definition, whether it be something that is a mind map or a collage or some way of externalizing that definition into something tangible that they would then share. And this is another reason why we use the Google Plus um, was to do the quick sharing and then it was, everybody else could see what it was that you were um, defining for that thing and it would fuel your own understanding and you would be able to consider it from different points of view. So it was your project, but it became exponentially more rich by seeing what other people were saying with that. And then the second day was the more intensive exercises where you would need to go out in the world and actively put yourself in that situation. So just using the theme of curiosity, or my, my module, we each took a module that we were responsible for shepherding into making sure that it would happen, but we all shared the coverage of all of them. So the one that I had responsibility for was failure, failing and succeeding. And so um, the kinds of projects that I would put up for um, failing was a crash and burn exercise. So everybody had to go out and do something they knew would not work out and do it anyways and then report back what had happened. And, um, and so that's how the social piece of it also comes into play. It, a lot of these projects couldn't be done without the social piece or not as rewarding or interesting without that social piece. Um, and then and can I ask you a quick question? And I, 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 so I love this idea that you send them out to the world and then brought them back. And when, just to clarify, when you say you bring them back, is that when you use the discussion forum as a means of them posting, okay, go find my blog post that I wrote about this or my Google Plus post about it? it the home base for you was always your discussion board as far as the social interaction. Is that right? Yeah, a lot of times it was report back in our shared forums, but there was also this piece of how will you report it? Sometimes we were explicit and said, um, you need to report on this by making a blog post and share your blog post, or you need to report on this by making a um, some kind of artifact. And sometimes we would leave that artifact up to them. So it might be an Adobe voice piece. It might be a Prezi presentation. It might be some other new technology that they hadn't used, and sometimes we would make suggestions, but we wouldn't not always say it had to be in the same kind of thing. But then it had to be somehow digitized so that they could point to it. Because at the very end, and this is the piece that holds it all together, is that we had a journey map. And they needed to put a, a, you know, a, a digital image or reference for each stage of those that journey map, and they also needed a URL to show that they had completed one of the exercises within that module and that they had reflect. So the, the last part of that template is to reflect on it. And that was the last piece. And so they had to do some reflection with each part of the module. And so at the end of each module, the quiz really was an accountability thing. You know, did you do this? What did you get out of this? What are you thinking around this? And then, you know, what's the URL where you posted your you know, what you did and your reflection. And so that all kind of came together and coalesced into a bigger picture. And what we really wanted to accomplish was to not only keep them accountable and not only have them support each other in, um, you know, exposing them to each other's definitions and each other's experiences, um, but also to help them you know, make use of technologies they hadn't used before. They don't get that chance, like, under pressure, like in the classroom. It's like, like they're so, oh, I'm going to figure out blogging, and here we go. Here they get to practice it, you know. And, and then finally, to create a tangible artifact that says, look, I'm on this journey. 
I see evidence of my experiences on this journey, and this represents something that is um, going to be ongoing, and I can see my growth. You know, we wanted to give them something where they can say, I, I can see my growth. And it doesn't stop here. This is, you know, a bigger overarching thing. And it's comprised of, you know, these littler experiences that you can revisit and do over again. But once you've experienced it, we also were really worried about people just reading the exercises and feeling like, yeah, 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 I got it. I understand the idea, but then not doing it. Because a lot of the learning happens when in the doing of it, because you get so emotionally involved, there's the tacit knowledge that goes along with it, you uncover how you really feel about something when you actually are put on the line. And so um, we were having conversations about motivation, internal motivation versus do we do badges? And uh, why, you know, I was one who was really against badges, but I was like, convince me, tell me that badges are what we should do. Like, I, I'm, I'm prepared to change my mind. But, um, you know, part of the value system or the value proposition was that um, a, ground, a ground up grassroots level, I care about this for myself so much that I would just do this. And I will make time for it. And by me valuing this for myself, you know, MOOCs have a 3% retention rate. You can start with, you know, a thousand people and on the good side, 30 will finish. And we found that to be really typical of ours as well. Um, and I really think that comes down to personal motivation and that's the rate at which people are internally motivated, you know, or, or, or prioritizing that in that given amount of time. So, and you know, it's kind of funny you mentioned this. We spend a crazy amount of time at the beginning of each cohort going through this um, application process, trying to, at first the thought process was to weed out those who aren't maybe that serious, because as I mentioned, we, we devote a tremendous amount of time from facilitation standpoint. So we wanted to make sure we were attracting those that were as well. So they had to have a reference. They had to, try to express, explain to us what their experience level was at both an academic level and a professional level. But then as you're saying, it, you know, these are volunteer things. People aren't necessarily, maybe a badge, a nice pat on the back, you know, a digital <laughs> pat on the back, whatever. But there's something else that motivates those that stick around that, to do it. And you can't necessarily tell that during the application process. You can't pinpoint certain factors. So we were, even what, as you're describing, maybe you could touch on that a little bit. I, I looked at some of your prior blog posts to try to, before we talked, to try to get a sense for what your course scope was. And it looked like you had about 1,100 people originally sign up. Is that right? That yeah, we did it two times. Yeah. And I forget the actual numbers, but I think, yeah, maybe it was about 1,100 the first time and maybe like 2,000 the second time. And it was different times of the school year. So I think it makes a difference uh, when when people feel available and when they feel like they can prioritize it against many other things. So, you know, a 3% in one case would be different from a 3% in another case only because of the time of year and the, their, their ability to prioritize it into mattering to them at that moment. Um, and that, that really comes into play as well. But, um, and so it looks like you did kind of somehow <laughs> come to some meeting of the minds in terms of a certificate. Maybe it wasn't necessarily a traditional badging deal, but you did have some type of, ta-da, this group did these, as you're saying, is that your map, the, the, the journey yeah. map? If those, those that completed it and had all the, the boxes checked in terms of... Yeah, so you know, you know, doing the journey map for themselves was kind of like a personal reward. And when people saw that, they, they, they could see something in themselves, in themselves of that. And that was in part what it was meant to do, kind of this empowerment device. So you make this for yourself, reflecting on your own journey, and you give yourself a pat on the back because you've stuck with it, and this means something. Um, and then we also did the certificate, and um, to some degree, perhaps that feels like an external reward, but it also is a, a strong act of appreciation. And it was it was really a congratulations. You did this for yourself, and this means something to you. And we're acknowledging that this is not nothing, you know. And so for us, the certificate meant uh, 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 acknowledgement and congratulations. 
Um, we also, you know, we talking a lot about how to offer credit for doing the class, and we're able through connections that um, Kathleen had and other people had, we're able to offer some credit through certain institutions for doing it. And they, there was a higher level of retention rate for those people. There was accountability and they had you know, a goal, a very specific thing that they were accomplishing for doing that. Um, and it's interesting because the online class was free in every case, you know, it was, it was we weren't charging anything for it. Um, but you know, you offer some credit and you will have some of those people really pull through in stronger ways, I think because of the accountability measures that are needed that go along with that. Um, the parallels are absolutely incredible. And again, scale is very, very different, but we, we're now, this will be our fourth time going through this. And so we've partnered up with, for example, a student from BYU worked through their intern office. They had to have to do a practicum before they graduate the program. And so they were able to use this experience. So we had, I had to fill out a couple of forms for them or whatever, but so we definitely also, again, though, that puts a lot of facilitation pressure back and ours aren't we don't charge either, <laughs> so someone's got to sit there and make sure these boxes are being checked. But to your point, I think that makes it much more relevant to the, the person who's doing it, and the more you can do that, the more you're going to get people uh, interested. And then to your point, what the cohort we just finished and all the others prior, um, um, as Wendy mentioned, we just finished up. So we sent everybody a letter of recognition. It's not like a reference letter, but it's more like, here's what this person did, here's the client they worked for, here's a link to where their deliverable is, it was a team-based experience. And the idea being when you go on your next job interview, you can say, I've done this. And, yes. and that, that's also valuable beyond just the piece of paper. You have something to talk about during your interview. So. Right, right. Those, I think those art, kind of artifacts are really important and not necessarily valued as much as, or leveraged as much as they could be. And, um, and I think that when somebody is going forward and trying to get a job or talk about what they did, Having those artifacts makes it a lot easier to talk about. And I think worth it from the facilitation point of view, even though it's more work, I think um, very much worth the extra work to say, you know, here's your either kind of like portfolio piece or, you know, the um, explanation of what you did. So you can tell, use those words to tell your administration, what it was that you just went through, um, and help that give them words for why this is important beyond themselves, that it is important for themselves, but it's also important to everybody around them. So one of the things that we really wanted to accomplish was that the teachers um, very kind of, that what we were doing for the teachers indirectly just trickled into the classrooms that it would help them adjust their, um, their outlook, their mindset, their beliefs, their enthusiasm, refresh them, empower them, help them to make change when they needed to make change, um, and all of those kinds of things. But we didn't ask that outright. It wasn't like, no, go into your classroom and do this whole thing, you know? It was like, how can we help you help yourself? And um, providing them with those kinds of artifacts. And we made a poster about all of you know the different ways that well this was for the 21 day challenge that we did out, outside of the canvas um, platform we made a poster here are all the ways that you know you are an empowered teacher and um, gave that to everybody so that they could put that up on their wall and remind themselves of all of the different ways that they could be practice empowerment and creativity and those kinds of things um, and and I think there's a lot more to be done there. It, I think it feels like small beans compared to credits, you know, receiving credits and things. But I think that um, with the MOOC platforms, um, so much being offered for free that um, it has this really interesting quality of, okay, we take the money out of it, what matters to you? You know, over to you. What matters to you? Because we're not asking for any money. And when you have that conversation, then it becomes a lot more personal about, well, how do we highlight the personal learning? How do we highlight the accomplishment? How do we highlight 
um, a growth mindset and the growing and the accomplishments on a really kind of personal basis. And what I think is really interesting, we're, we're all instructional, Wendy and I are instructional designers by training and <laughs> profession. And so as you're saying things like words are bing, bing, bing in my head, but um, like we, we, what you did at the first part of your thing, we would call that um, kind of activation where you're activating prior um, experiences and emotions, getting them to think about, okay, here's our new topic. Um, what does this mean to you? And just from my observations and participation in various MOOCs, as you said, we all just have to deal with the attrition. You know, some people just like, I do it all the time, lurk a couple first few weeks, is this, or even a few days, is this what I'm interested in? Oops, nope, not, I'm on my way. But I think, to me, it's that, get hit, hit him early with, um, how is this experience going to be meaningful to you long term? And it's always a struggle when you're teaching any course is to think about people who have huge arguments over, should we have outcomes? Should we you know, predefine what are our outcomes for the, for the course? And I think I've always argued, well, if you title a course right there, you've kind of talked about an outcome a little bit because we're going to be roughly talking about that issue or topic or whatever it may be. But, um, but I really like your, your um, approach where you, ha you did lump it into five sections. So, yeah, we're going to be covering the – it's not like you can now talk about dentistry or something. You know, we're gonna, we are going to be focusing on this general area. But tell us what you bring to this and why you're interested in those types of things, um, which I think – I don't know, Wendy, if you have the ability to talk right now. Do you have any thoughts or comments on, on what Tracy's saying or – how this rings true to you as far as what we've done before and, and some of these things we could borrow as we as we go forward? Yeah, I've really found so much synergy that if we change the topic, if Tracy had changed some of the words of the topic was the um, design document and they were reflecting and sharing maybe a piece of the strategy and maybe how they got the students or the learners to practice the content as they were developing this design document, it would be the same kind of thing. It is a journey still for an, a novice instructional designer to um, go through that process of, of um, exploring both as a learner and the instructor in designing that document because they're sort of both, are they both roles in that process um, until you become the expert? Um, I don't know. I guess I'm, I was just sitting here reflecting the whole time on the yeah. synergy. It's amazing as you were saying things like, oh, we do that. We try that. <laughs> I knew you two needed to meet. This is so great. Yeah, and the scale is so different. And that's what freaks me out is because, um, and you, you talked about the intensity of being the facilitator. And you, it sounds like you did chunk it up with um, multiple facilitators. So you were able to take a little bit of a breather during the five weeks to some degree when it wasn't probably your focus week. You know, you could probably uh, move things around a little bit um, from a facilitation standpoint, but like realistically, what is it like to have the 2000 or whatever, you know, started with a thousand and the second one was 2000. And I guess, again, it whittles down to a smaller number, but it's a lot of people. And, and it's how much time realistically does it take you? Did it take you to, to do this? Was it like a full-time job for those five weeks? No, it, no. So that part is not a full-time job. It's more a job of consistency and really like slowing down because this is not like a skim job. It's not like you're scanning the news and taking what you want and not taking what you don't want. It really is the effort is more of consideration than it is of, um, you know, like epic time investment. And so it is definitely not like a full time job. It's definitely not like, oh my God, I just I can't deal with the. I mean, there's a lot of um, conversation that happens, but the challenge is in the thoughtful response more than anything else. And that part does take time. And so I would kind of, for a while, I was just doing the strategy of constantly checking or, you know, reacting to the notifications that somebody had said something. And that, that is effective, but it does wear you out because it's a very reactive mode and, you know, you're in the middle of whatever it is, making dinner for your family and somebody brings up this topic, just, okay, let me just take care of this. And then, oh, that, that will wear you out quickly. So then I was trying um, a strategy of, you know, morning and night. And let me just go through like nothing. Else. I'm not doing anything else. I'm just at four, you know, starting at whatever time in the morning and going through everything since the previous day 
and offer responses to all of those. And then again in the evening. And then, you know, I got to a point where I'm like, you know what, I could do this once a day. You know, the immediacy part of it is important. And people really like it when, you know, they feel like you are right there. But it really is okay to even do it just like once a day um, and still feel like you're very responsive and present. I would say that if you space it out more than that, like more than a day or, or even like when you get into two days, then the leg will become noticeable, but it doesn't have to be real time. This is a perfect segue to a question I had. And I think Wendy and I, were, when we were talking before, I think you two were participants in a MOOC. Um, was it uh, the Penn State Creativity MOOC, which is ginormous, right? Um, and I think, Wendy, um, you mentioned they did make some attempts to have some synchronous sessions where the facilitators, I don't know if they aggregated questions or tried to bundle some things. Is that how they approached it? Did you, and Wendy or, or Tracy, did you find that an important part of the experience? Or was that, yeah you know, I paid attention a little bit, but I really didn't attend or listen, or how did it fit in, I guess, big picture with the other asynchronous discussion board type things that you were able what to What did you do? think, Wendy? I attended one of the mook ups. Isn't that what it was called, a mook up? Yeah, I think it was. Something like a hookup, but it was a mook up. And I remember Kathleen was on, a you know, a, a friend that we have is was in, I think her questions were selected or she was chosen as one of the MOOC participants to actually be live with the instructors and just based on her line of questions. So that was interesting. I missed that, but I saw the recording of that one and I watched another one live and I felt like, wow, oh, they're real. They really cared about us. It really connect and we're such a huge class and it's, it personalized the experience. But then again, I didn't use every single opportunity to do that. Maybe just those couple connections was enough for me to feel engaged you know, more too. How did you yeah. feel about it? Did you attend? I think I attended like one or two, but I have to say it wasn't a standout for me because mm. I think that my expectation was that the um, synchronous um, engagement, it's, I think it's really hard to make the synchronous engagement scale well to the expectations of what's being learned. And so for those mookups, it felt more like um, um, kind of like, a, well, here's a student project and how are you doing? And it's nice to get that information, but you can also get that asynchronously. Um, so it, it was nice to see people interacting like that, but I mean, it, I could just as well watch the broadcast later. It didn't have to be at that moment. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, I, I don't know. And um, so it, it did offer a more kind of real time component. So, you know, the, that particular class was offered over and over again, at least two, maybe three times. And so having the MOOC ups or the synchronous kinds of things offered a more um, contextualization in time. Say, this is the one that's happening right now. Here are people happening right now that make it um, uh, special in that way, or you can identify it with it in that way. But, um, and so we were trying to do some synchronous things as well for our Canvas, um, you know, five habits of highly creative teachers and we were like well what does that need to be in order to feel like a learning experience to feel like there is this engagement like and we were like well we need to have we need to set it up as a really good conversation and so some of the times we would invite other speakers on the topics somebody who would be we um, really respected and felt like we're cutting edge and who we could have the, a conversation with and ask questions back and forth. And so I invited for my module Al Alistair Arnott, who wrote um, a book about a failing for positive failure. And we just had a really great conversation where anybody and everybody could ask him questions and we could talk about, um, you know, whatever was on our mind about failure, about that theme. And so it became kind of more this um, 
ability to have a face-to-face -face conversation, a different mode of social forum than just purely textual. And um, so we were trying to do that uh, every two weeks or something. That's a little bit harder to pull off. It takes some orchestration and it takes some coordination. And so did you use Hangouts, Google Hangouts? Is that what your platform was a choice? Yeah, so he, it was, um, people could just participate in the text chat then when they were asking questions and things, yeah. Right, exactly, exactly. And we were, and so we recorded it, and so people could go back and listen to it later. Um, and we could have some people come in live as part of the broadcast, and then we could have other people just, you know, the audience and looking at it whenever they wanted to look at it. Right. Well, I, I'm trying to be really respectful of your hour. I kind of, I don't, I think I said hour. I hope I at least carved out yeah. that, but I could talk all day this weekend. We could, I'll fly out and we can have coffee, but um, I do want, before we wrap up, this is such an interesting facet of your life, but you just from even, like I said, virtually stalking you on your blog and other places you are <laughs> on the web. Um, I know you're doing so many other cool things and I've even seen that you've run courses where you basically handle it by email, right? Where you... Yes. assemble a distribution list and you blast it and people are kind of left to their own to do stuff and you know that's going back to the old days of distance learning you know <laughs> instead of having email you would maybe get a you know packet in the mail but can you explain the, where did that come from and how does that compare to the experiences you have on these um, in the MOOCs that we've been talking about well so the canvas.net platform is just a formalization of any kind of paste delivery system. And you get the opportunity to use somebody else's technology within a certain structure to format that to whatever liking that you want. But really, email is no different. It just has certain constraints um, that just maybe function a little bit differently. But in essence, it's it achieves the same kind of thing. It's, it's a paste kind of thing. So, what I would do is to, um, you know, for, for my, my own workshops that I have with, with art making is I would set up the kinds of activities that I feel um, would inspire people and move them to action in interesting ways. And I would write an email a day based on those themes and based on kind of paste in a certain kind of way that would leave them in a certain experience and have them go out and do something. So I would just use MailChimp, the free version of it, and I would write the email with the topic, the, the, you know, the concept, why it matters, or how would we think about this, and then give some kind of instruction. Now, the sharing platform is still really important. So the instruction there is to go and to share your work. And I've tried it both with a private community where that's where people would go, you know, they would get their daily email, they would do their thing, and then they would go and um, do the thing and share it on, in, the, um, in the private community. Well, then I was experimenting with, well, why not make this a broader thing? You know, people are involved in the workshop, but there also needs to be some awareness building around this. People need to be aware of why this matters in general and why the people who are doing it actually care enough to do it. And so I tried the experiment of sharing it, not in the private community, but sharing with hashtags. And so, um, and that takes a takes some finessing, it takes some sensitivity, and it takes a lot of courage and bravery. Um, but that also, that's also a conversation to be had. And it's not just with the people who are having the experience together, but it's with the people who care about those people. And that they become the support system. They become the people who say, oh, what are you doing? That's amazing. You know, or I, I, I think this is wonderful. And they get feedback from very unlikely places, which is also, um, that level of indirection is also part of our intrinsic motivation, you know, scaffolding. And so, you know, the emails as a delivery device, I feel like um, it's maybe more archaic than a, you know, a MOOC platform technology, but really, honestly, it's kind of no different. It's just 
a, you know, how do you, how do you just structure it to help people into the concepts? Yeah. I, I always think of things in terms, especially as you're saying, send people out with hashtags or whatever it may be. I always like to have, and I've used the word a couple of times here and I use it all the time. Otherwise is um, home base just so, and, and it sounds like your email was the home base. It's like, okay, let's every day, let's, you know, <laughs> right, re sync up again. And here's what we've been doing and what we're going to be doing. And whether you do that, like the first time we ran our cohort, we did it on, um, uh, Google Sites, which is it's ugly, but it served a purpose. We could use the Google forums and we could use Google Plus if we wanted or whatever. But that, that ugly, as ugly as it was, that was our home base. And I've taken wonderful MOOCs that are done on a wiki. And so it's just, it, yeah. for me, it's the best part, trying to leverage the best of both, send folks out, but at the same time, um, don't get, get people lost or help people get unlost. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'm all, I'm all over the place reading blogs, but now what do we do next? And it's yeah, like, how do we? How do we come back to center? Uh, and I had to do, um, I augment that with content on my website. And, and I knew that I needed to um, frame expectations and that had to live somewhere other than an email. And I needed to make all of the resources available. And that had to be constantly available, not something that would just be in an email. So I ended up making like a hub page with all of that stuff on there. And, you know, so at the end of that was kind of like getting feedback to say, well, how, how, how did that work for you? Um, because I, I really was using, um, you know, very low fidelity kind of mechanism to deliver this. And it was like, well, how can I um, refine that so that you have the level of, you know, presence and you, the pacing is, is working out and it's, it meets you where you're at and you're able to act on it. But yes, you also feel like there's a there there. Where's my common point? Where are all the people? How do I interact? How do I keep track of things? And those kinds of things. And I think my challenge was how do I do that with tools everybody already has? You know, so uh, there's a lot of inventiveness that can happen, but you know, there's trade-offs, pros and cons. So if you had to do it all over again, as we're winding up here, would, would you use Canvas or is, are there other tools that you, you're like, wow, if we'd been able to, and I, I, as we're saying, every tool has an, its advantage and, and disadvantage, but um, everybody's, like, in fact, Wendy and I were um, communicating on Facebook yesterday where her school has now just adopted Canvas. All the higher educational institutions are adopting it. So it's, clearly got features people like um, but yeah so it depends on your goals and so if you're not wanting or needing to charge money um, canvas is wonderful because um, they can help with traffic they can help with getting the word out and they have special ways of doing it sometimes they will say here are our top 10 education classes that are going on right now or coming up soon that drives traffic and attracts people like crazy. It's really, really, really helpful. So um, I would, uh, if that is, is the goal, is to uh, reach out to as many people as possible and you're not concerned with trying to monetize it, then I would definitely use that again. Um, if there are ways that you're wanting to monetize it, Canvas would be a little difficult. You, it's not that you can't charge money, but compared to everything else on Canvas, why would you know they take it if they had to um, be charged for it? So, um, but then you know, doing other things uh, like building it yourself through a um, kind of a commerce site website works perfectly fine. But the trade-off there is how do you build your traffic into it? How do you get um, uh, people to be aware of it and now all of a sudden you do have to market and that's a whole other job in addition to just the content building the facilitation and uh, getting everybody where you want them to be and knowing what they want to know and that kind of thing um so i think it comes down to that and if if your goal is not necessarily to monetize it. You have many, many options, and Canvas.net being one of them, and a really good one at that. 
Well, and maybe that's a good place for us to close as a marketing. <laughs> we'll let, give you a, a chance to stay, to sell some, sell your wares. Is there? I, I noticed on your website, it, it doesn't look like there's anything upcoming currently, right? As far as a workshop, but do you have a schedule up for your next uh, next project? Well, so I just wrapped up an online workshop, and so that's where I'm actually least organized about like what's coming up and. Um, so I, I have kind of my token workshop, which is about people finding their own self-agency through their art making and finding their inner artist. They do not have to say they're an artist or self-identify with that. I, I do not care. And, and I'm hoping that they realize they don't care either, that they just make marks on the page and that they reflect on what they want in their lives. And so that workshop, um, ended and I'm still wrapping up from that one. I will likely offer that again later this year. In addition to that one, I also do Google Hangout sessions that are are free, where just for an hour or hour and fifteen minutes, um, what are people interested in? And um, we get together in a Google Hangout and we'll do something like um, one that I did was how to take an old book and make it into an art journal. Like, just how do you do that? And then we will go through that and do that together. So it's not necessarily like, here's the instructions. It's just like, let's, here's the supplies. You bring them, we'll hang out, we'll do this together, and you'll have, you know, peace ready. Um, and I'm exploring other kinds of workshops that will tie in with a lot of the different um, uh, topics that I'm involved in. So for instance, right now I'm in the midst of writing a book with another artist that's about art collaboration. And so we are going to um, likely be facilitating certain events around that, that may or may not be, um, you know, money oriented or, you know, monetized, but that we help people find their own sense of um, self-agency to highlight their ability to collaborate and um, flourish even more. So when we get the book out, then we're going to figure out how, what kind of events will surround that. Oh, that is awesome. I cannot even, this is so exciting. It just, I, kindred spirits make me so excited. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> and it's like, I, I was talking to a good friend of mine yesterday. Yeah. It's like, um, it, I'm kind of like, okay, I'm not, I'm not going to waste my time on a lot of things that aren't interesting to me. I'm not, I just about to turn 49 and it's like, you know what? I am focused. Like you said, we're not going to make millions doing this probably. I mean, maybe I can't imagine. Maybe. Anyway. We won't count it out. <laughs> <laughs> One dollar at a time. I don't know. But I mean, this is, I think we're in the three of us in particular, we all had jobs, corporate jobs at one point and yes. tried that. And you know, that's just, didn't quite cut it for us. So um, I just really want to thank Wendy for making the introduction. And Tracy, I hope you'll still stick with us a little bit in some capacity to at least guide on the side and let us know if we're you know, yeah. going down the, the wrong track or whatever it is we're thinking about it. But um, from, from as we've been talking yeah. along here, it definitely, I think this is a, a path we're going to keep going on. Um, and hopefully in the fall, we'll get our ducks in a row and be able to, to release something um, as well. Sure, sure. I'm happy to help in any way possible. I mean, I feel like I approach a lot of things, you know, really kind of bootstrapping and hacking and figuring it out. And will this work? Maybe not. Maybe this will work. And maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. And I'm completely cool with just, you know, what now? All right, we'll figure it out. And but, you know, I think it all comes back down to kind of really knowing and being clear about the values and what you want to help other people do. And um, so even if you don't know exactly how the technical pieces have to fall into place, a lot of times the values and the, you know, the, the, what you want to see happen and how you want to help people answer those things for you. There's a lot of guidance in it, I find. And so on one hand, I feel like I'm flying by the seat of my pants. On the other hand, I feel like, yeah, as long as this can happen, it's good, you know? Is, isn't it? I, and maybe, maybe you disagree, but for me personally, my idea of, or even caring about failure these days, I mean, I don't want to completely fall on my face, but if we just say, everybody take a breath, you know, that no one's going to die over us having like a week where we're a little discombobulated, let's just chill and then, yep. you know, group, so. Yeah, absolutely.
responsibility. Well, thank you so much. And we made it exactly in an hour. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so, great. Yes. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, who, who, we have a few folks who joined in. And we'll, um, like I said, we'll get this posted up. And I'll send you a link. And can't wait to talk to you next time. Yeah, looking Absolutely. forward to it. Thank you so much. Great conversation. I love what you're thinking about. <laughs> great. Thank oh, you. Great to talk to you, Tracy. Thank you. Thank <laughs> Always leads me with energy. <laughs> Thanks.